But he was a former grave digger, hobo, and a coffee machine repairman. He has much to say, and all of it worth listening to. Please come to the common now and hear our keynote speaker, Will Bronzel. Good morning. Welcome to the third beautiful day of the 39th Common Ground Country Fair. <laughs> My name is Jean English. I edit the Maine Organic Farmer and Gardener from AFCA. And I would like to acknowledge Tim Nason, who puts together <laughs> the paper and rarely gets the credit he deserves. Today, I'm so happy <laughs> to be able to introduce Will Bonsell. Not just happy, but also I feel very honored to introduce him as our keynote speaker. I first met Will at the 1986 Common Ground Country Fair. One of the first exhibits I saw when I walked in was this amazing table with dozens and dozens of potato varieties. And Will was standing beside it, talking a mile a minute about potato varieties and parsnip varieties and Jerusalem artichokes and a million other things. So I started scribbling very fast and interviewed him and ended up sending that article to the Christian Science Monitor, which was very happy to run it because they like to balance the news of the world, so to speak, with really uplifting stories. And Will is an uplifting person. Will is a homesteader, a seed saver, a writer, and a speaker, in addition to the things you heard on the PA system already. As a homesteader, Will and Molly Thorkelson cultivate their Cardiger farm. They've been doing that for more than 40 years. They raise almost all of their own food, and they cycle nutrients within the farm. So all the fertility is generated on the farm and recycled. They've also raised two sons on the farm. He's a seed saver. He founded and directs the Scatter Seed Project, which keeps hundreds of plant varieties available by propagating and growing them, fed co seeds, calls this effort Beyond Heroic. More recently, he helped found the Grassroots Seed Network, a democratic network for preserving, maintaining, and sharing open pollinated seeds. This is a very important effort, so I would urge you to do anything you can to support that in Scatter Seed Project. Just go to grow seed, grassroot, grassrootsseednetwork.org and find out how you can get involved in that. Will is a lot taller than I am, so I'm having a little trouble here. Um, Will is a writer. He's done a book of fiction. It's a futuristic eco-novel called The Yarrow Tales. And when I read that, a lot of it reminded me of the Common Ground Country Fair. So if you're looking for a good read, check that out. It involves a community called Asperia, and Will will be mentioning that in his talk. He's written many articles for the Maine Organic Farmer and Gardener and other publications. And this year, Chelsea Green published his book, Will Bonsell's Essential Guide to Radical Self-Reliant Gardening, which is available up here after Will's talk, and he has it at his booth in Egg Demo. In the book, Will covers in depth his knowledge about growing food in novel ways, and he expresses this with his irrepressible humor and thoughtful philosophy. My goal, he writes, is not to feed the world, but to feed myself and let others feed themselves. If we all did that, it might be a good beginning. And finally, Will is a great speaker. He's a favorite speaker at the fair with workshops going on this afternoon. He speaks at the Seed Swap and Scion Exchange, which takes place here in April. He'll be talking about nut trees at Mofka's Farmer to Farmer Conference this November. And finally, He'll be giving today's keynote speech, Organic and Sustainable, a deeper look. Please help me in welcoming Will. Thank you. Hi, everyone. 
What a great day to be here, and what better place to be than the Common Ground Fair. This is, uh, you know, I've, there's no place quite like it that I know of. I've, I've heard rumors that the Waldo County Sheriff's deputies have to be very cautious not to mingle in crowds when they're traveling around because they'll get hugged to death. <laughs> Can you imagine if you're a little kid and have to get lost? Where in the world better to do it than here? So what a wonderful place and how honored I feel to be here talking to you guys today. I've been asked to share some thoughts and so I'm about to do that. Those two words, organic and, um, and sustainable that we bandy around so much in, in uh, alternative agriculture um, circles, do we really know what we mean by them? We've, we've bent over backwards to try to define them, but are we really there? Because let's make no bones about it. They are very radical ideas, and whenever we see them gaining mainstream acceptance, uh, we need to watch out whether, in the words of the old song, something's lost when something's gained in living every day. To be perfectly organic and perfectly sustainable is to hew to a very extreme line. I don't hew perfectly to that line myself, but I like to keep an eye on that line for perspective and to not lose sight of that ideal. So what does it mean? When we use the word organic as in organic matter, well, we simply mean carbon-based materials as opposed to the mineral part. In other words, basically what humus is all about. Yet mainstream agriculturalists like to point out that it is all organic, including the stuff from oil wells and laboratories. Isn't that what organic chemistry is all about? Indeed, it's all natural, since everything somehow comes from nature. Well, clearly there's some distance between, um, between our definition and theirs, but at least we all know what we mean by it, don't we? Or do we? J.I. Rodale, an early proponent of organic in this country, emphasized the two negative or limiting parameters of organic. No synthetic fertilizers and no artificial, no synthetic pesticides and no artificial fertilizers. However, the original coiner of the word organic, Lord Northbourne, used it more broadly to view the soil as a whole organism, an integrated system of systems, all functioning together to the mutual benefit of each other, and, uh, and the whole, the web of life. Hopefully, balanced by the myriad interactions of the parts. What an excellent model. How well do we copy it? In fact, all agriculture, including organic, is inherently unnatural, in that we profoundly disrupt the existing ecosystem, whether forest or prairie, to impose our own sense of order. Now, I'm not condemning our food system, merely challenging our smug ideas of what is natural. Nor is it balanced. Otherwise, we wouldn't always be needing to amend our soils, not once, but over and over again, with stuff from far away, and to devise pest control strategies to keep everything in balance. So what about the word sustainable? What's all that about? In most contexts, the word refers to something that can continue again and again indefinitely um, without, relying on, without constant reliance on external inputs. In other words, the opposite of a support system. As with the word organic, the need for repeated applications of imports from outside the system belies the very use of the word sustainable. Just for example, the University of Maine has a sustainable ag uh, program which assumes the use of fossil fuels and petroleum-based materials and includes some use of synthetic pesticides. It doesn't exclude them, but it aims to greatly reduce them. And I say, that's wonderful. Really, I'm all for compromises. I'm all for in incremental change and less than ideal compromises. I just like to recognize them as such. 
I make expedient concessions every day, and I call them that. I aim for something better, but meanwhile I don't like to kid myself. I began my working career at the ripe age of 16 in the mining business. Copper, lead, zinc, silver, that kind of stuff. And I left it in favor of the recycling business, which is what organic farming is, or purports to be. But when I saw all that emphasis on bought-in minerals like lime and phosphate and sulpomag and azomite, I had to ask myself, didn't I get out of that business? And what about all that disposable black plastic mulch and polyester row cover and irrigation tape? I know, I know some people insist that these are organic and that they are consistent with organic. Well, then some people insist that Elvis is still alive. These are some people's answers to the problems of disturbing nature to grow food. And I don't so much quibble with people's answers. I'm more concerned about the questions they ask or don't ask to arrive at those answers. Again, I make compromises every day. Uh, meanwhile, I don't want to kid myself. One of the main challenges to maintaining soil tilth is the minerals. After all, the organic part is composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, all freely circulating around in the air and water around us and easily sequestered by the soil community if we just manage them prudently. The mineral part is a particular challenge because they're either in the soil to begin with or they aren't. And if they aren't, they must be brought in from to the soil. They won't get there by themselves. Of course, there's the matter of erosion. Soluble minerals, such as boron, can be washed away or leached downward, or in a few cases like iodine, uh, can evaporate upward. Now, stemming that kind of erosion is relatively easy using good management practices like terracing or contour planting or minimal tillage or mulch. But the greatest form of erosion is the hardest to avoid because we don't even recognize it as erosion. And that is the marketplace. Well, of course, the whole point of growing crops is for others to eat them. But unfortunately, those eaters are far from the land. And thanks to a modern convenience called the flush toilet, those nutrients are never going back to the land whence they came. At best, they end up recycled into sludge compost to be spread on golf courses and park lawns. Due to the, ultra, the uh, uncontrollable c contamination by heavy metals and other chemicals, it cannot be applied to organic food crops even though that is potentially the most organic practice of all. In other words, that fertility cannot return whence it came. It is not an organic cycle. It is a broken chain. The lost nutrients must be replaced from elsewhere, must be mined and processed and carried to our fields with a huge carbon footprint. I hope we're beginning to see that the problems of sustainable agriculture are not just the farmer's problems, nor is the farmer capable of solving them alone. They are part of the larger problems of our civilization, along with sustainable energy, sustainable technology, sustainable population, sustainable defense, etc., etc. My own personal approach to sustainable soil tilth is more feasible for self-sufficient homesteader types like myself than for most market gardeners and farmers. The food I grow is eaten by my family and our bodily wastes are composted and returned to the soil over and over again, indefinitely. I'm a bit extreme about this. No, we don't require dinner guests to stay till they've used the privy. <laughs> but yes, when I die, I hope to be cremated and spread on the land which sustained me in life. I say, forget about my mind. A corpse is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> I'm not trying to derive cash income from my crops. We get that from other sources, including writing and talking about farming. Well, hooray for me. But what about others who indeed need to grow and sell crops for a living 
and thus need to send their fertility off to the marketplace. Is there anything they can do in a real and imperfect world to increase their, soil, their, their real sustainability and to mend some of those breaks in the cycle? There are indeed. But first, it helps to have in our mental toolkit a concept for which I have coined the word co uh, eco-efficiency. Every organism, whether mushroom, mouse, or magnolia, requires a certain amount of earth stuff, let's call it, energy and matter, to become itself. As it dies and decays or is eaten, that stuff is released and passed on to other life forms, a form of immortality that doesn't require faith to believe. However, there is plenty of loss at every level of consumption, as is shown by the food energy pyramid that we all had in our high school biology texts. And that loss is not uniform. It varies enormously from one organism to another. And that is what I mean by eco-efficiency. As that pyramid chart showed us, the producers at the bottom, all plants, are the most eco-efficient. The rest of us, animals, microbes, etc., don't produce anything at all. It's kind of humbling. Rather, we all consume, only at different orders of magnitude. Even among plants, not all species are equally eco-efficient. For example, Brussels sprouts are real shirkers compared to, say, rock maples trees. On the other hand, I can use or sell Brussels sprouts which I cannot do for human food, which I cannot do with maples. Given that understanding, we can do several things. For example, we can all become vegans. No, really. That alone reduces your eco in, uh, footprint by about 90%. Not interested? Okay then, let's just look at the crops themselves. Regardless of whether they're used to, to, front, to nourish people or livestock. If we allow enough cropland for a generous green manure rotation, we can produce food for the crops, crop plants that feed us or our customers or our critters without the ecologically wasteful importation of organic matter from away. Now that's organic matter. As for the minerals, we should first make sure that they are indeed not there already, as opposed to being present but unavailable to our crops. A laboratory test doesn't, doesn't tell everything. After all, what is soil but a vast array of ground up mineral particles? Some of those particles are too large to be soluble or too deep to be accessible. Well, some plants have the magical talent of eating those rocks, dissolving them, and assimilating them into the, uh, into the organic system, where they eventually become available to other plants, which are less resourceful, and ultimately to us. Just for example, some sedges and ferns and horsetails are able to dissolve silica, think glass, and render it usable by, quote, higher plants, which incorporate it into their outer layers, sort of like armor. Again, buckwheat has a curious ability to dissolve the mineral apatite, calcium phosphate, which is common in most soils, but which most plants cannot appropriate for their own use. Again, lichens can dissolve feldspar particles, releasing the calcium and potassium in them. Before we go fetching in lots of stuff from outside of our farm system, perhaps we should be sure that we're making good use of what's already there. Even minerals which are comparatively abundant can be locked in precipitate form, particularly on burned out or overcultivated soils. High humus levels, and I don't mean like those found in most organic gardens, but rather like forest soils, will form an environment where soluble nutrients will remain soluble 
without leaching or evaporating away. Rather than obsessing over pH or NPK, we should be focusing on creating ever more humus. As for the, those minerals which are too deep for crops to access, either because of leaching or because that's where the glacier deposited them, we should bring them up into the biosphere, up into the world of the living. Our wimpy crop plants are mostly too shallow rooted to do the job for themselves, but other plants are up to it. For example, yellow dock and dandelion and alfalfa and sweet clover are able to delve down deep into that netherworld and pump up uh, precious minerals up to the surface via their extensive tap roots. By including them in our green manure rotation mixes and in our hay fields, we can enhance the tilth building process at all levels. If we have forest nearby, and any sustainable farm system should include some forest, we have a ready source of minerals from great depths. Forest trees, especially old growth hardwoods, are unsurpassed for reaching down and dissolving and bringing up the whole gamut of minerals. Whether in the form of tree leaves or chipped ramial wood or ashes from our cooked fires, these mineral laden residues can enrich our cropland soils without ever having to send away for them. I would be the last to insist that there is such a thing as sustainable mining, but if there is, I believe it must, include, it must involve forest trees. In order to become more sustainable, we have to get over the mindset that I often refer to as cake mix farming. Add some of this and some of that until it's just right, and then sell the crop and start all over again. And those thises and thats invariably come from far away and carry a huge carbon um, tag, price tag. Sometimes we can get better and longer lasting results, not by adding something so much as by doing something. Let me give just one example. A friend of mine years ago had a tiny plot that he wished to prepare for crops but it was very acidic. It was partially shaded by an aging oak tree. It had a slight depression where water often stood and where oak leaves and pine needles had accumulated, not being able to decay in that waterlogged environment. He proposed to add a lot of lime to raise the pH, but I suggested that would only have a slight and temporary effect. The situation was that extreme. Instead, at my recommendation, he dug a shallow ditch to drain the excess water off. And he dumped the ditch dirt into the depression um, to raise it slightly. He cut down the sickly tree so that sunlight could reach the soil. And of course, he dug up the plot, which allowed oxygen to penetrate the newly drained soil. And now, the very leaves uh, which, when cold and matted, had contributed to the acidity, now had just the opposite effect. Aerobic bacteria accelerated their decay into buffering humus. Ironically, by the way, both oak leaves and pine needles uh, contain su substantial amounts of calcium, which, when released, helped to further raise the pH. Within the year, the plot was suitable for general garden crops, and the leaves that used to drift in there were now raked and shredded and composted and returned to that plot as a mellow, life-sustaining humus. He got all of these results, high organic content, uh, improved drainage, um, balanced pH, available minerals, all without adding a thimbleful of imported amendments, but simply by doing things. By this, I'm not suggesting that one can keep sending crops off to market without replacing them from somewhere. But as I describe in more detail in my book and in my classes, there are some things we can do and more that we must do to reduce the deficit caused by our persistent sending of nutrients away from the place of their origin. Ultimately, the solution may be less a matter for agriculturalists and more for sanitary engineers 
who may find a way to segregate our bodily wastes from the toxic contaminants that render these wastes useless for food um, production. Even if you are not an organic gardener or farmer and buy most of your food from the store, there is still plenty you can do to make our agricultural system more sustainable. Keep your food shed as small as possible. In other words, buy and eat local. I once saw a bumper sticker that said, to hell with organic, buy local. That saddened me because it showed an ignorance of both organic and locavorism. If a farmer right in my town produces a crop for market using imported fertilizer or even manure from animals fed on imported grain and using synthetic poisons from Monsanto or wherever, does it become local just because his house happens to share my zip code? Conversely, if my food co-op offers Armory-approved winter vegetables from California or Chile or China, just how organic is that anyway? Organic and local are two sides of the same coin. You cannot sell out one for the other. And lest anyone assume that a locavore, locavore diet would be monotonous or limited, just take a look at the diverse offerings in the Mafka Organic Price Report. And that's not at all complete. Many growers don't report, plus there are many small growers who are not certified, but organic nonetheless. In any case, it pays to know your grower. In addition to the usual fruits and veg veggies, main organic farmers and gardeners are producing grain and grain products, soybeans, such exotic items as tempeh, shiitake mushrooms, fresh ginger, even rice, once when I was in Barrels, a wonderful store in Waterville selling a main grown and main made products, I was delightedly surprised to see not one, but a few uh, brands of vegetable oil, mostly sunflower, grown and pressed right here in Maine. Price-wise, these products do not and cannot compete well with stuff from away, nor should they have to. The competition has huge advantages of scale, heavy mechanization, distribution system, and cheap migrant labor. However, such local foods do give us a chance to vote on what kind of a food system we want. We only get to vote at the polls once a year, and is anyone really listening? But every time you stand at the checkout counter with your wallet open, your dollars are voting. And believe me, someone is paying close attention to what your purchases have to say. So be sure not to throw away your vote. Just by the way, it disturbs me sometimes when many organic farmers complain that the public will not pay their justifiably higher prices, but then they themselves often turn around and buy Walmart food. How can we expect others to support us if we won't support ourselves? Now, up to this point, I've spoken only about sustainable farming. After all, this is Mafka. But that's only part of the sustainability picture. A truly sustainable agriculture cannot exist outside of a truly sustainable society and with a sustainable economy and a sustainable technology, etc. Earlier I mentioned the dilemma, po dilemma posed by our um, sewage disposal system, but that's merely one example. Our entire agricultural system, even, uh, including organic, is predicated on machinery. And I say, well might it be. Filling all of our needs by the drudgery of hand labor is unrealistic, if not impossible, physically impossible. It would, be, it would inevitably lead us back to some form of human slavery which we're far too close to even now. Even the use of animal slavery, such as horsepower, is sustainable only insofar as we have lots of spare land, which we don't. Granted, it is generally preferable to gas-powered machinery, but are those the only alternatives? Can we find anything better? Let me make it clear right now that I am not a traditionalist. I'm not Amish, I'm not a Luddite, 
I'm not a reenactment buff. I do not seek to go back to the good old days, those halcyon times where women stayed in the kitchen, workers knew their place, and colored folks kept to themselves. My vision for a sustainable future does not look like a Courier and Ives print. Those things were all steps on the path that brought us to where we are now, and I do not wish to retrace those steps. Living history museums do not evoke a sense of nostalgia for me. They only remind me of where we went wrong and what we must correct. I want to keep moving forward in a different direction than we're moving now, but forward, not backwards. My own vision for a sustainable future, a sustainable future involves lots of machinery, appropriate sized machinery, and certainly not powered as they are now by exploding dinosaur farts. <laughs> but what then? What a simplistic technology we have that relies so exclusively on the internal combustion engine and the electric dynamo. There are in fact many answers, but they all depend on how we ask the questions. <clears throat> Just for example, we might avoid or at least minimize the use of plowing and constantly disturbing the soils. We might do that not only for the soil's sake, but to preserve energy. And the kinds of machines that we do use could be powered by things other than gasoline. I remember once reading about tractors used for forestry in mainland China that were driven by charcoal-fired steam engines. The charcoal was produced by the very forests where they worked. How neat. And what about electric? The main challenge for electric and hydrogen-powered automobiles is the problem of range and inconvenience of recharging. But for on-farm applications, such as walking tractors, they might be much more practical. Spare batteries or compressed hydrogen cylinders could be stored in a shed and replaced every couple of hours, which you can't do on the road. As for the electricity itself, there are lots of ways of producing it on farm. Wood-fired steam engines, photovoltaic cells, solar generators such as the Stirling engine, funky Savonius, so, uh, Savonius uh, rotor windmills, wood gasification plants, float mills, etc. The overall complication and limitation um, is the, uh, the, the storage and the portability of that electric of that power. And recent developments in battery technology seem to, po seem to hold a lot of promise. Those factors which limit electric and hydrogen powered vehicles on the highway may not be problems in our fields and gardens. The important thing is that they do not release fossil carbon. And thus they give us the potential to be truly sustainable and organic in the most profound sense of the word. We need to take a hard look at all of those. I'm more of a farmer than an, enge an engineer. However, I am aware that there are many more alternatives than we are exploiting. Okay, so aside from fossil fuels, what about all those synthetic materials used by organic growers no less than their, uh, their conventional counterparts? The black plastic sheets, the rime, the seedling trays, etc. Don't they all come from oil wells? Yeah, they do but they don't have to. When we think of polymer, plastics, and such, we assume petrochemicals, but only because that's the cheapest feedstock to use. There are others. For example, cellulose is a polymer. Indeed, soluble cellulose is the basis for cellophane packaging, which has been largely replaced by polypropylene. Camera film used to be derived from cellulose, along with sound recording tape and rayon cloth. Who knows what role these organic and sustainable polymers could play in agriculture, indeed in our lives, especially if we eschew the use of deceptively cheap fossil polymers. Now, of course, the watchword word of sustainability is recycle. So are these wood-derived polymer materials recyclable? I believe some of them are, but that's almost beside the point. If they are, or as long as they are, derived from 
um, non-fossil uh, sustainable polymers like cellulose and not from, um, not from dinosaur farts. Even if we burn them, we are no less sustainable than when we burn firewood. As long as we maintain, as long as we maintain enough forests to sequester the carbon released by the burning, then we can have a truly sustainable system. You see, the main reason we haven't pursued these sustainable polymers further, indeed have largely abandoned them, is that we are in denial. We're refusing to acknowledge the elephant in the room, the sea of petroleum that washes over our entire civilization, distorting the apparent cost of everything while hiding the real cost. I'd like to wind up by telling you about a place called Esperia. A few years ago, I wrote my first book, an eco-novel called Through the Eyes of a Stranger. I have some here, by the way, a few. It deals with a future society which some readers have insisted on describing as a utopia, though it is not intended to be. What I was rather trying to portray was a society which is as flawed as the individuals who comprise it. They have not solved all their problems, nor ever will, any more than we will. Every society, like every species, is under constant pressure to evolve to changing pressures. Every solution begets new problems, and vice versa. That's what life is all about, and evolution is a response to life. Esperia, the land of my novel, is also evolving amid all its faults. However, it has one virtue which trumps all of its faults. It is profoundly sustainable. Esperia is not the land of perfection, it is rather the land of hope. As long as they are sustainable, they can make mistakes and try again and again to get it right. Time is on their side. But what about us? As long as we are not sustainable, it matters little what other progress we make. Racial harmony, gender equity, ending poverty, curing cancer. Without sustainability, it will all be swept away in a short time. It will be like rearranging the deck furniture on the Titanic while ignoring the iceberg straight ahead. We must all come to recognize that our gardens and farms have no borders, and we must integrate them with the larger world. If we hope to even approach sustainability, we must do some deep accounting. We must keep asking ourselves the difficult questions. What's the real bottom line? And who or what is paying the bill? Organic is about so much more than what we do or don't put on our gardens. It is more than what we eat. It is how we choose to live our lives today and how we envision our future. Thank you. I don't know if it's appropriate or conventional to follow um, keynote speeches with Q&A, but I noticed yesterday's speaker did, so I'm fine with that. If any of you want to uh, you know, beat me up a little bit, then that's uh, whatever, I'm, I'm here for you. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, as soon as possible, we all want to head for lunch. But this, this woman has just made a profound confession of her sins here. She's, she's pointing out that she's totally into sustainability and would like to avoid the fossil fart material but finds in many cases um, what is more expedient for her is to use some, something that's already been thrown away. Maybe, maybe she never used it, someone else's plastic or you know, lunar cans or whatever, and to incorporate them into her system. And again, all she's doing is reiterating what I said before. It's a real imperfect world. She didn't have control over making that waste, but she is part of the solution. And so what do I say, but give it up for the lady here. <laughs> B.D. Parker's got a great question here, and uh, 
again, she thinks she's confessing her sins, but I, I'm very quick to forgive. Um, she's saying she, like me, likes to use lots and lots of leaves, and she gets a lot of them in town, where we might assume, rightly or wrongly, that they might have some contaminants, that they may not be as pure as we would like from, from the virgin forest or something. Well, okay, now it's my turn to make a confession. I did the same thing. I have many acres of forest. I could go into my woods and get them, but I find it a lot easier to go into Farmington several miles away, rake up people's lawns. That stuff is going to go to the landfill, leave mine in the woods, and bring it home. It, uh, is, I've tried to find it where it doesn't have doggy doo-doo in it and not too many twigs. And I, I, don't, I hate collecting leaves the day after Halloween. Uh, all the wrappers and crap, thing, yeah. But anyway, but how much of a concern is it that tree leaves and rain, gypsies, forest things, if they're coming from a, an urban area, a suburban area, that they're contaminated? Um, one way, of course, find is to talk to the owner. And if, if it's, uh, you know, this particular lawn, do you use a Smith, whatever, client butter products it is on your field, on your, on your lawn? Uh, or if not, when? Um, I am under the impression that people in Farmington, where I get mine, just by looking at their lawns, I think most people don't, don't do much of anything for lawn care. Uh, they don't look very manicured for the most part, and uh, I don't know, I see too many dandelions to, to believe these people. Are Even if they do, then that raises another question of, that might make me not want to use their grass clippings, but how much does that affect the trees, which generally are much deeper rooted, and are the trees at all selective in not taking these things up? I'm not an expert, I believe that's the case. I don't know whether the tests, I'm sure tests have been done, is about the, what the take up, uptake with, with trees. Um, but again, we're comparing um, goods with better goods and evils with worse evils. And it seems to me like those, those must be very, very, very benefit, beneficial in proportion to the evil in them, if indeed there is any evil in them. That's just my opinion. No, no, you're <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah um, I've been asked for, for interesting reasons to take a straw poll right here. Of all these listeners here, how many of you are in fact vegan? Some very enthusiastic ones, but a small percentage of the group. Okay, that's interesting. How many of you are vegetarian? Okay, oh, a lot more. I've noticed when I go, when we eat at the um, staff kitchen, I, some days I feel very sorry for the meat eaters because uh, there's, uh, in that particular community, group, group set of people, there's a, uh, it balances the other way around. Um, so what it was suggested, um, I suggest roots to becoming a vegan. Well, for one thing, I'm not totally comfortable doing that, you know, someone else's suggestion, but um, the first thing is, is whether you want to be a vegan. If you don't want to be a vegan, I'm not going to give you steps, so do, do, do what you're doing. Just do what you're doing better. If you are interested in it, um, then, well, there are, ask people um, that uh, for recipes and sharing ideas. One of the main things I would mention for vegetarians, and especially for, for vegans, that a lot of people, very typically, I see a couple where the wife gets into veganism and the husband has, res sometimes the other way around. That's kind of a guy thing, you know, we don't like to change stuff. But another reason why, I think is a very good reason. Sometimes people's concept of veganism is like alfalfa sprouts and, and carrot juice or something like that. You know, the salads and whatever, uh, we think, hey, where's the beef? You know, the guy. Well, there are all kinds of hearty, filling entrees that have enough protein and enough carbon, you know, that are thought to be the roast in the middle of the table. But unfortunately, many, especially new vegans, often neglect that. And so someone, the kids or the guy, especially saying, okay, I'm going out to McDonald's, this isn't going to do me, you know. So to avoid that, we've got to be, to do what it takes to make a meal rich enough to be filling. Beyond that, I don't have a, a lot to add to it. Uh, some of you are next. Another question, not mine, but uh, everyone wants to use you for, you're, you're our, um, what do you call it, the group, um, um, what do you call those groups that the advertising people, uh, research group. Yeah. Um, how many of you grow a significant amount of the food that you eat? By the way, you'll notice I'm not putting my hand up, even though, and my family aren't either. And it's because uh, even though, um, as Jean described me, as, uh, we grow most of our own food, um, again, if you look at the big picture, a huge part of our diet is grain. Well, people say, well, Will, you do grow grain. You grow a lot of grain. Uh, believe it, I do not grow uh, probably half of the amount of grain that we eat. And some people look at us as extreme of, you know, you and the Nearings, you do it all. Well, they didn't either and we don't either. Um, we, I always try to grow uh, some grain and soybeans and things like that. Well, the soybeans and beans is easy to do. And grain is easy to do, but not so easy to do on the scale that we eat them. And uh, I aspire to grow all my own grain, wheat and so on. 
and uh, some years I've come closer to it than others. But I also, pretty much every year, I adamantly grow some grain. I want to keep my hand in it with the idea that I could extrapolate that at any point. That's my own thing. So two things. Question. Yeah. The second question is, what would you consider to be local purchasing, like mileage distance? For those okay. Who don't uh, you're asking me or asking me to ask them? No, you. Okay. She's asking me, what distance do I consider to be local? And I have, I, I have no answer at all. But being me, I will give you one anyway. Um, <laughs> It depends a little on what your priorities are, and depends on what the thing is. I mean, um, I expect my, you know, my a lot of the easily grow my tomatoes. I expect those to come within 100 feet of my kitchen sink. A whole lot of those vegetables. Um, the uh, the grain, if I'm I'm growing some grain, buying some. Well, if the best I can do is get it from Vermont, although increasingly we can buy it in Maine, um, then I then I shoot for this. I can't give a single cut and dried black and white answer to that, but. Um, depending on the food, I get it um, in town if I can, or very, very locally. There may be someone locally who grows the stuff, but the way they like it, I, um, you know, they like to put all kinds of junk on it that I don't approve of or something. There's, there's different parameters to consider. So I, my answer is kind of a non-answer. Yeah. She's wanting to know if I use seashells in my garden. I think there's an ulterior motive. I think she sells seashells by the seashore. And she wants to, I got it, I got it. And she wants to know if I'm a customer. But, um, no, I don't. I have no objection at all, even vegans. I don't have any reason not to use seashells. They really work well. Oh, they work very well. They kind of need, ought to be ground up or, you know, mushed up a bunch to be really cool. They will naturally. When I used to have them in my seaweed, that seemed like they'd last for, for they had they had half lives. No, it sounds um, like if they're mussel shells, they're going to biodegrade faster. I see. So so she's saying they can break down pretty rapidly. One way or the other, I see no harm in using them. The only reason I don't use them is I'm what I don't go to the coast that often. I have there's all kinds of other things that get them much closer. That would be pretty close to a sustainable, however, source of calcium for his soul instead of get. Um, and, and, and some phosphorus and some, yeah. Um, although leaves, I, I pretty much look to maple leaves to produce, uh, and several kinds of leaves, particularly maple, to be sources of calcium and phosphorus both. I, it takes tons, a ton of leaves to get what 100 pounds of, let's say, bone meal would get. But it's easy, and a, and a few seashells. But, it, but I, on the other hand, it, my land produces vastly so much more um, with all kinds of other benefits, like having trees, yeah. Okay, this fellow has made a couple of really, really good points. But first of all, uh, describing his own personal situation, which is so typical of many of us, lives in Portland, um, uh, works in a health food store, yeah. there, or, oh, I thought you said something. <laughs> but, 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 but eats out of a health food store, when he can so much as he can, um, is not uh, so flush that he can just go anywhere and buy food at any expense. And so, basically has to make a lot of compromises between affordability. Well, quite frankly, we all do. And, uh, and that's good. Again, it's the case of doing however much you can. Uh, not in a situation to grow your own. Well, make the choices that are viable for you. And we're all different that way. So there's no way anyone can prescribe or judge or some of the choices that someone makes. Second really good point that he makes is, um, and I hope I wasn't um, letting myself be misunderstood about saying that these other things, um, that the benefits of modern society that we have gotten, like more greater racial harmony and gender equity and so on, that these are not as important as um, basically becoming sustainable. He makes an extremely good point. It is, uh, it's, it's sort of like analogous to the thing I made before about local and organic. You can't swap one off for the other, saying that creating a society where we have these, this social justice and such things, uh, without it, we probably will not get to sustainability. So it's a, it is definitely a two-way street. And I would not for the moment suggest that we should focus on one and ignore the other. There's that, that's a, but, so thank you very much for that caveat. For, yeah. um, she's from Boston, and I, and I, say, I mean that in all the best ways. Um, she, uh, she's saying that there's uh, options such as uh, the farmers are bringing stuff in, to co you know, co buying co-op and so on, but also things like container gardening. So there's, She's not going to be self-sufficient with her little cherry tomatoes in the flower pot, but she's that much self-reliant, that much sustainable. And isn't that better than you know whatever else we... You can grow basil inside. You grow basil inside, grow parsley, a lot of things you can grow inside, yeah. And again, 
they don't solve the world's problems, but they reduce the world's problems by that much, and there's absolutely no reason we shouldn't all um, do whatever we're capable of. We're, we're all coming from where we're at. Good luck. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let me urge you all to go have a good lunch if you aren't already, and I'm, I'll sign some books here if anyone wants. Thank you very much for joining us today. And we just want to give Will a final thank you from Maka and present him with these shirts and hat. Thank you for coming. <laughs>